Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, every Sunday at 8.30 in the morning, and then repeated at 4.30 in the afternoon. You'll also find Wichita Liberty TV at my site, The Voice for Liberty, on the internet, that's wichitaliberty.org. There you'll find all the past episodes of Wichita Liberty TV, show notes, for this episode and other information that I and others put up there almost every day. Today, our special guest is Dave Trobert, who is president of Kansas Policy Institute. He does research and writes on fiscal policy and education issues. His commentaries have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Investor's Business Daily, The Washington Times, The Daily Caller, and in newspapers across Kansas. Prior to joining Kansas Policy Institute, Dave spent 30 years in the television industry and served as general manager of several stations, including Cake TV 10 here in Wichita. He graduated cum laude from West Liberty State College in West Virginia with a degree in business administration and a major in accounting. So, Dave Trobert, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. Thanks, Bob. We have our co-host Carl Peter John uh, today as well. So. I don't know if it's the biggest story in Kansas, but for the past four or so years since the tax reforms that were passed in 2012, we recall the governor saying it's going to be a shot in the arm and we're going to be booming and so forth like that. That probably hasn't happened, and I don't know we've, how we should treat the, the promises of a politician. I remember Barack Obama saying, if you don't pass the stimulus, unemployment's going to go to here. Well, we passed the stimulus and unemployment went to here and stayed higher than here for quite a while. But what's really been the state of the Kansas economy since 2012, 2013, when this tax reform took place? Well, the economy overall has has been uh, struggling most recently with some factors that have nothing to do with tax policy. Uh, agriculture has, which is always uh, in, in very cyclical, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, we've seen oil prices plummet. Mm -hmm. uh, oil was probably around a hundred dollars a barrel when the tax plan was passed. Now it's around fifty. Fifty, yeah. Uh, and and Kansas is a state that is much more dependent upon oil and natural gas extraction than most states. So uh, that's had a a very significant impact. In fact, the the Department of Revenue has maps where they track sales tax revenue by county. And you can see the counties where uh, sales tax receipts are down uh, pretty much overlays the parts of the state that are uh, either dependent upon agriculture or oil and gas, or in many cases, both. Mm -hmm. Other parts of the state, we're seeing sales tax increases up. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the, the sales tax uh, shortfall has been one of the real challenges in the last two years uh, with the state budget. It never gets any play. The focus is always on that piece of the tax policy that media doesn't like. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when we talk about whatever budget shortfalls the state faces, the LLC pass-through loophole, whatever you want to call it, that's, I don't want to say insignificant, but it's a fairly small amount of money compared to our total budget gap. Is that right? Absolutely. The, um, the, the, the business, the LLC pass-through uh, exemption, uh, only accounted for about 29% of tax reform overall. 71% went to reductions for wage earners, yeah, uh, regular personal income. income. And, and so it's uh, the, the fiscal note, which is the department, the kind of the insider baseball term for what does it cost um, if it gets repealed, is about $180 million a year. Mm -hmm. uh, by no means has that been the reason that Kansas has had budget shortfalls. It, I mean, so obviously it contributed, you can say it contributed because you cut the revenue, but at the same time they cut the revenue, they wouldn't cut spending. And you see we always, uh, in the newspapers, whatever it is, budget shortfall, when are they gonna start talking about excessive spending? I mean, because a budget can be balanced either way, right? Uh, well, they call it a shortfall because technically there is less revenue projected than there is spending right. projected. 
and so spending is coming falling short of revenue. But uh, sometimes the numbers that get talked about in terms of the shortfall uh, are inflated. Uh, and, and, and in this case, um, uh, for 2018 and 2019, it's about 200 million more uh, that they're talking about. When they talk about a billion dollars, 200 million of that is just funny money. I think you mentioned that in one of your articles that part of that 200 million shortfall would be this local aid, aid to property tax or something like that, that we haven't done for quite a while, but it's still in the budget. Right. The, the statute, there are statutes that say every year uh, a certain amount of money will be transferred for local ad valorem tax relief. Uh, another certain amount of money will be gone going to uh, city and county revenue sharing. Uh, there's even one in statute right now that says $60 million will be transferred to the Bioscience Authority that no longer exists. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So instead of, you know, because they stopped transferring that money, LAVTR and city county revenue sharing, they stopped transferring that at least 2004. So instead of taking it out of statute, one time, every year what they've done is say, well, except this year. But we'll leave it in for future years. And so that shows up, or that contributes to this shortfall. Because, since it's in statute, then the budget estimators have to say, well, on paper, we have this obligation. We all know it's not going to happen, but because the legislature hasn't removed it. So somebody could go in and say, let's just admit we're not going to spend this. One time, take that out of statute. And you still could spend the money if you wanted to. You could appropriate it. But... $200 $200 million of the budget deficit disappears just like that. Interesting. Let's take a moment off for a commercial break. I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be back. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Carl Peter John, Dave Traubert, President of Kansas Policy Institute. Carl, talking about state aid to local government and your experience as county commissioner, did you rely upon that revenue in your budgeting process? Well, city county revenue sharing and what was called LAVTR uh, all uh, had been significant programs, but at one time, but they've been gone for over a decade. And so my question, Dave, um, why hasn't the legislature done away with them? At the, we at the local level never even considered them uh, when we were doing our budgets when I was on the county commission. You know, I, if I had to guess, and that's all it would be, uh, it's politics. Because if you take it out, then I would bet that the city and county lobbying groups would attack legislators for somehow cutting their funding. It would, it would be misconstrued. But they, they complained about it every time, Dave. I, I, we fought this at the Kansas Association of Counties because we said, look, uh, Sedgwick County was the only county supporting the uh, limits to growth and property taxes, but these LAVTR and revenue sharing programs are boilerplate within the city and county organizations. Sure. Uh, but the only reason I think it stays in statute is uh, legislators haven't had the courage to run the risk that cities and counties would use that to uh, unfairly uh, hit them over the head. So, uh, so it stays there. Uh, well, the, the, and they, they get hit over the head. Our, our Kansas Association of Counties would say, look, they have not properly funded LAVTR. And oh, of course. And, and, and property taxes, and, and the ironic thing is that money was supposed to uh, redu provide local property tax relief. The years that it was funded were the years that Kansas had the highest local property tax increases. They basically took that money and laughed just, all the way to the bank. Just spend it. Yeah, the money's yeah. fungible. <laughs> yeah, and the League of Kansas Municipalities is a, one of the most powerful lobbies in Topeka, I'd say. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like municipality, that's something we like. It, it just it's just names, but it's it's funny sometimes. So this week, um, Alec, the American Legislative Exchange Council, you've had some experience mm -hmm. uh, serving on task force, I believe, for them. Each year they do their Rich States, Poor States program. It just came out this week. They have an economic outlook rank that they calculate each year based on things like tax rates and uh, 15 factors altogether. In 2013, Kansas ranked 11th among the states, pretty good. But since then, year by year, it's been down to 15, 18, 27, 
and this year 26. So really not much change. But uh, what does Kansas need to do to get on track, do you think, to really have the type of robust growth that we'd like to have? I don't know when we last had it, but that we'd like to have again. Well, Kansas really hasn't had robust growth, and that was one of the leading uh, prompts for doing tax relief. Uh, but in order to get back to ranked 11th and ranked 13th, you do the things, you stop doing the things that got us ranked 18th and 20th and 26th and 27th. Um, Kansas moved into the 11th best outlook in 13 because in 12, they cut taxes. We had the tax reform. It didn't, no, it didn't go into effect until 2013, but there was a significant reduction uh, primarily to individual income taxes. And so that created a tremendous potential looking forward for Kansas to experience more economic growth. Uh, but they didn't structurally balance the budget. So they cut taxes at the end of 12. And in 13, instead of coming back and uh, balancing the budget by reducing costs, which only would have bounded to about 8%, mm -hmm. having state government operate about 8% more efficiently. Instead, they raised taxes and they raised spending in 2013. And we had a, a pretty big balance in the bank that they used to cushion right. a couple years of, I would say, spending more than revenue. Right. And then when uh, 2015 rolled around and most of those reserves were gone, then they increased taxes, mostly the sales tax and right. some cigarette tax. They increased taxes and they again increased spending. So we went from a position of looking like we were going to be operating much more efficiently and letting people keep more of their hard-earned money to saying, well, backing up and backing up and backing up. And so it makes sense that, that the economic outlook uh, went, went in reverse. Yeah. And I remember at that time that uh, KPI published a paper that says if we could have a one-time cut of 8%, then we could then go back to, I think, the original growth trend and we'd still have a balanced budget yeah, every year. Yeah, and, and the, the analysis we did at the end, after the 12th session uh, showed that about 8, 8.5%, 8 either one time or maybe two, you know, 4, 4.5% 4 over two years, uh, one-time reduction in waste, basically get that much more efficient. And if they did that, then from that point on, we would always have healthy ending balances and spending could grow as revenues grow. Am I right in thinking that cutting taxes is fairly easy, but cutting spending is just almost impossible? Uh, it, it is a challenge. And, and so that the, uh, I wouldn't say cutting taxes is easy, but it's mm -hmm. certainly easier mm -hmm. than, than getting enough votes together to reduce the cost of government. And just to, to put a little perspective on that, well, we had to at one point, as we said, talk about 8.5% reduction. In 2015, Kansas spent 27% more per resident than the states without an income tax. Uh, and that's the secret to having low taxes. The states that tax less are able to do it because they spend less. Every mm -hmm. state provides the same basic basket of services. There's education and transportation, social services and so forth. But the states that tax income, of which Kansas is one, spent 42% more per resident than the states without an income tax, 42%. That's, that's uh, quite and, a and, well, and Kansas was at 27% and coincidentally, Kansas also in 2015 had 27% more state government employees than the states without, or than the, the national average. Yeah, we have a lot of state well, and local. Carl, hold on to your question for a moment. We're going to take a moment off for a commercial break, and then we'll get to Carl's question. Uh, Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. Our special guest this week, Dave Traubert of Kansas Policy Institute. Carl, you had a question. Yes, Dave, you talked about the states without an income tax. There's, I believe, nine of them. Um, has there been a real focus on, and I think there are five states without a statewide sales tax, too. Um, have, have Kansas Policy Institute looked at those states that uh, don't have what they like to talk about in Topeka as a three-legged stool of balanced income s sales and property taxes compared to uh, what I view as high tax. Unfortunately, I think Kansas is still a relatively high tax point on the prairie. Kansas is. And the, the, the myth uh, of the three-legged stool, uh, and I call it a myth because it's not about having uh, stable government funding. 
Uh, I mean, that's the, you know, the three-legged stool, you don't want to be wobbly. Uh, ironically, states are far better off with a two-legged stool um, of sales and uh, consumption and property tax. Because, and, and Kansas is the perfect example of that. In, in the last recession between 2009 and 2010, income taxes in Kansas receipts dropped 21 percent over a two-year period. Sales tax only dropped 5 percent. Now, which budget would you rather manage, <laughs> where your revenues are down 21 or 5? Oh, I, and, I, and that's because incomes can be volatile, especially proprietor's income, uh, corporate income. Uh, and if you have a recession with a lot of layoff, now you're going to lose uh, withholding tax as well. Consumption, on the other hand, well, it will drop. It won't drop as much as, as the income tax. So government, if the goal is to provide a stable funding source for government, you do not want to be funding it with income tax. That leg is all about social engineering. Who pays and how much? Well, well if me, we add, I'm sorry, go ahead, well, Let me follow up on that on the spending side, though. If you're in a situation where you're spending, when they talk about spending cuts, are we talking about not necessarily cutting, but a reduction in the increase as opposed to a cut in the normal sense of the word? And if we look at personal budgets, if I cut 2%, but up in Topeka, I've often seen that they, it's 2% against last year's budget, which actually had an inflation factor into it, or it's 2% against a projected increase of 8%. So instead of an 8% increase, it's a 6% increase. Right. So th there's, th you know, when, when uh, that, that's absolutely right. Government often calls not getting to spend as much more as it wants as, as getting a cut. Uh, but in, in terms of what you're cutting, um, you're not cutting the service, and, and that's a distinction that, that government needs to do a much better job of making, is that you can reduce the cost of the service. Because again, every state has education and transportation and social service. Uh, you can't name a state that doesn't have all the same kind of programs as Kansas does, but they provide those at a better price. So it's not cutting, when people think of cutting, they think, well, they're going to cut my program. And frankly, that's what government threatens to do a lot because it's easier than actually going back and looking at now how can we operate differently we'll just kind of hold the citizens for ransom and threaten if we don't get the revenue we want then we'll have to cut something you want but they this, can reduce the cost of the in service. In this analogy with the three-legged stool, you know, if there was another method of taxation that was dreamed up, you'd hear these people talk, oh, how great a four-legged chair is, you know, and, and uh, things like that. Uh, Dave, one of the things the legislature has to do when it gets going up again pretty soon is to craft a school funding formula to replace the block grants that we've uh, been operating under for the past two years. Uh, there's kind of an outline in place so far, isn't there? Well, there is a bill that is in the House Education uh, Budget Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't call it an outline in terms of, they don't have anything that in our opinion would meet the constitutional test of adequacy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, one of the proponents of basically what they have is a more expensive old finance formula. And what the Supreme Court said in March of 14, and then they reaffirmed uh, last March, uh, this March, was that they set a new test for adequacy. They said adequacy is met when funding is reasonably calculated so that students can basically achieve the Rose standards. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they also said that total spending is no longer the touchstone. Uh, so that if students are achieving the outcomes, then funding by default becomes adequate because that's the primary test. So you have to have funding be reasonably calculated and, and, the, you know, and, and the courts not only in Gannon but in Montoy chastised the state repeatedly for having no basis for their funding. They basically plucked a number out of the air. Mm -hmm. What they have to do now is go back and show how you show your math like the old like our math teachers show mm -hmm. us your work. How did you arrive at this number and what connection does it have to outcomes? The bill that's in the House Education Committee right now uh, makes no effort to do that. And the bill 2410 that was introduced by, it was called the Chairman's Bill, uh, Representative Larry Campbell, did attempt to calculate uh, the funding level, but the, the nine members, nine of the 17 members on the committee overrode that, and they just one amendment at a time turned it into a much more expensive version of the old formula. So we don't have anything in our opinion right now that, and, and we asked uh, one of the representatives behind that, Melissa Rooker, uh, from Fairway, and and she finally admitted off the record, you know, not in testimony, but they didn't even try to attempt to calculate the funding. It's just more money. 
When we come back, I want to continue on the school funding formula to see what is the potential for school choice in Kansas under a new school funding formula. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, welcome back to this last segment of Wichita Liberty TV for today. Our guest in the studio, Dave Traubert, president of Kansas Policy Institute, and of course, Carl uh, Peter John. So continuing on about the school funding formula, one thing that people like myself, and I think a lot of Kansas parents are hoping is that we'll have increased school choice in Kansas. Does the discussions around the school financing formula include provisions for school choice? What do you think, what's the outlook for that? There are many of us who would like to see school choice enhanced uh, in the formula and accountability uh, is the other thing that we need, especially now that the court says outcomes matter mm -hmm. most. So we believe that there should be a mechanism where uh, teachers and employees in individual buildings should be rewarded if, they are sh if their building is showing improvement. Mm -hmm. But the kids who are stuck in the worst performing schools in Kansas should be allowed to leave with an education savings account. Uh, there, is, uh, there are some legislators who like this. Uh, most uh, are, are not interested because the schools hate it, the unions hate it. They do not want to be held accountable. It's one of the things most citizens probably don't understand. The school funding formula has never held schools accountable in terms of if you don't help these kids move forward collectively, there's a consequence. So uh, in fact, what, what some of them are trying to do is eliminate the only school choice program that Kansas has right now, the tax credit scholarship program. And that's been pretty successful in Wichita at the Urban Preparatory Academy, but even then, it's only about 100 students or something, isn't it? Uh, uh, there, I think this year there's 188 kids statewide. Okay. Uh, and, and yet and that's viewed as a grave threat to public education in Kansas. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because uh, I, I would say that if, if that's a threat, it might be a threat to the institution, Right. but it's student-focused. And I think that's one of, the one of the big cultural transformations we need to make in Kansas is that we actually put students first in our decisions and, and not worry most about the institutions. And I think some states have done a better job on that with things like charter schools and all sorts of other forms of school choice. Oh, they have. I mean, it's, it's blossoming across the country. Yeah. Uh, here in Kansas, we, we have uh, probably the worst charter school law yes. in the country, mm -hmm. uh, and we only have this small tax credit scholarship yeah. program. Carl? I was going to say, I, my experience was that the KNEA and their affiliated uh, supporting organizations, the School, school Board Association, uh, the two of the very most powerful, in fact, I'd say the most powerful lobbying groups up in Topeka at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, when it's for the kids, you know, how can you, uh, that's the, the well, language Well, and it's the lobbying, uh, if I could, it's not so much the lobbying, it's the firepower they bring to the elections. And the political mm -hmm. clout. It's, it's the threat, if you don't do what we want, then we, we can get, our PACs can get rid of you. Well, in the couple minutes we have left for today, uh, Kansas uh, turned down Medicaid expansion several years ago, but this year a Medicaid expansion bill passed. Both chambers, uh, governor vetoed and the override was not uh, sustained. Did I say that right? Well, anyway, uh, they failed to override the governor's veto. That's but better. since then, a uh, big hospital in Topeka, St. Francis, has talked about they may have to close. And they, at least, and I think some of their allies, say the lack of Medicaid expansion in Kansas is a reason why. They, they do say that. Uh, there's no evidence to support that. There is evidence, however, uh, that that particular hospital, which is a mile away from an even bigger hospital, uh, is uh, they've been experiencing financial difficulties for a few years. It has nothing to do, they were experiencing financial difficulties uh, before and after uh, the Medicaid issue came up. Uh, they've been closing clinics, they've had a lot, they've gone on record. In fact, there's been media articles uh, about the financial difficulties that they've had and a lot of management and a lot of uh, kind of consumer behavior shifting. And, and perhaps part of it is that they have an overabundance of hospital beds mm -hmm. in, in Topeka when you have something Stormont Vale just about a mile away. Uh, but in terms of uh, Medicaid expansion um, being the salvation for rural hospitals, uh, the Sentinel had a story uh, recently uh, showing that rural, hundreds of rural hospitals have closed 
across the country, including in states that did expand Medicaid. This is just one of the false narratives that gets used uh, to justify the end, the people who want to expand Medicaid. Uh, but it would be, expanding it in Kansas would have very large budgetary impact, and, and it's hard to put a number on it because uh, most states that have done it have seen extraordinary budget overruns. Like they, twice as many people enroll or something like that? Things like that. They've been off by hundreds of millions in some of the larger states, billions. Uh, and that's based on the federal government providing the funding match that has been in place. Uh, even Barack Obama, uh, when he was president, said he didn't know that the United States could continue to maintain that high rate. And if you do, then if they pull that back, the, the taxpayers are on the hook in Kansas for the balance. And we've seen, as Carl, we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, that uh, in states that have done Medicaid expansion, they still spend more on emergency. The people go to emergency rooms even more than they used to uh, before they had Medicaid. And the that was supposed to be something. Medicaid, the people who didn't have coverage and those who had Medicaid coverage, it was interesting that they expected the people being added to Medicaid would have better outcomes, and it turned out that they didn't. It really doesn't have a study, so, so it's an uh, ironic yeah, it was the situation. Oregon study. Yeah. Yes, yeah, in Oregon. Exactly. Well, guys, we're, uh, we've run through another episode of Wichita Liberty TV. So, Dave Traubert, president of Kansas Policy Institute, thank you. And Thanks, Carl, Bob. thank you. We'll see you again uh, next week. So, that's it for Bob Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks.